Welcome everybody out to Money Matrix. We are in week nine. Today I've had a lot of requests for the six principles of persuasion. Now I've given some of these hacks um, in our previous weeks, but I thought, you know what, why don't I take all of them and put them into one PowerPoint? Now the benefit of this as well is I also want you to use this PowerPoint. So I'm going to email you this PowerPoint for your own disposal, for your Thursday night events, your Saturdays. So everything on here will be yours. Also, feel free to change any of it. Some of the stories are my own, so obviously delete those and make it your story, okay? So with that being said, let's get going here. The Six Principles of Persuasion. This is by Robert Caldini, his book, Influence, Science, and Practices. I think every one of you should buy this book, Audible or Amazon. Uh, he has two versions out there. You want the one with the red cover. It is the shorter of the two. So there are six principles. The first one is consistency. We all want to stay consistent with our beliefs. Think about ISIS. Think about the um, suicide bombers in World War II. People will do anything based off of their beliefs of their identity of who they really are. Ben Hooper, who is the governor of Tennessee, I've shared this story in the past with you guys about how when he was a young boy, everybody would call him a bastard. Everyone would tease him, boy, who's your daddy? Boy, who's your daddy? And one day when he was at church, a young preacher saw the boy and asked him, you know, boy, who's your daddy? And everybody looked at this little kid thinking, oh, man, we are going to find out now. You can't lie to a preacher. We're going to find out. Is it Tom? Is it Jim? Who in the neighborhood impregnated his mom? And all the eyes were on this little boy, and he shrunk, and his shoulders came in, and his head went down. And this intuitive young preacher said, I see the resemblance. You're a son of God. Go claim your inheritance. And every moment after that, when someone would tease him, hey, boy, who's your daddy? He'd say, I'm a son of God. That consciousness, that identity that he had changed his entire life. He became the governor of Tennessee with myself. I was, you know, a high school dropout. I was very uneducated. I didn't learn to read until I was 19 years old. And forever I called myself stupid. Well, when you call yourself stupid, you act as a stupid person does. You get into a lot of trouble. You say things that are wrong and inappropriate. You make bad decisions. And when I hit my 30s, I thought, you know what? This, this label is not working to my advantage. And I read a quote by Charles Handel that said, 100% concentration is the distinguishing mark of a genius. And instantly, right there for the first time in my life, I thought, I might be a genius. What I mean by that is, based off the definition, I have an incredible ability, because of my OCD, to focus on something till I can wrestle it to the ground. So based off his definition, I must be therefore a genius. When I started labeling myself as a genius, then and, you know, not telling other people, hey, I'm a genius, but just labeling myself as a genius. From that age forward, I wrote 16 books. I've done three movies, three infomercials, spoken around the world. All those things happened the very second I changed my identity. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is the people you are coaching, the people you are marketing to, they're not rejecting you. They are just staying consistent with their personality. So you cannot take it personal from a marketing standpoint, whether they buy or not buy. You have to ask yourself, what is their consistency? What are they doing to stay consistent to their beliefs? So here's a couple fun case studies. Small commitments lead to large commitments. Psychologists Jonathan Friedman and Scott Frazier did an experiment in Southern California where they asked homeowners to put a large sign in their yard that said, drive carefully. Only 17% said yes. With, a, with another group, they asked if they could put a small three-inch sign that said, be a safe driver. Two weeks later, they came back and asked those same people about putting in a larger sign. An astonishing 76% said yes. A 450% increase. That is phenomenal. That happens because if people commit to something small, this their consistency, they want to stay congruent with their consistency, they will say yes to larger things. So where does this apply to you and your business? When you have new prospects, when you have new IMAs and different people who come on board, simply make them make a small commitment at first. Uh, commit to attending the next three or the next two Thursday night events or the next Super Saturday. And then from there, commit them to a larger thing. 
Consistency. De La, Sol, uh, De La Salle high school coach Bob Latour won 151 games in a row for 12 years straight. He had the world's highest, and for NFL, NBA, uh, MLB, the highest um, success rate of winning of any coach ever in history. And then his team lost a couple of games. And then they went back and won another 248, making a total career goal of 399 wins. All because he was consistent with his team by making them make small commitments that led to larger commitments. This is from the movie When the Game Stands Tall. I highly recommend it. If you guys do movie nights or group uh, activities with your prospects or with your IMAs, by all means, watch this movie. They will take their commitments and put them on three by five cards and then hand those to other teammates. And those teammates are now holding them accountable. So small commitments lead to large commitments and public commitments lead to stronger commitments. Subway. In the 1990s, Fred DeLuca wrote on every napkin that they'd have 10,000 stores by 2001. He was asked why he would write such a thing, and his reply was, if I put my goals down in writing and make them known to the world, I'm committed to achieving them. They now have, I think, 46,000 restaurants worldwide, so they exceeded their goal by 2001, but they also then continue to grow and have 46,000. They're the largest restaurant company in the world. So the second uh, principle of persuasion is likability. We are attracted to similarity. Think about this for a second. And I'm not talking about racism or sexism, but when you walk through the mall and you see someone who looks like you, who talks like you, you instantly feel more bonded to them than someone who looks completely different than you. We want to do business with the people we know, we like, and we trust. Think about why celebrity endorsements work. I Googled cele celebrity endorsements to create this page for you, and it was hysterical, the images I saw. So you have Kanye West, who's a rapper, sponsoring Adidas. What in the world does that have to do with running in athleticism? It doesn't. You got Kim Kardashian, who's famous for nothing, who's <laughs> supporting Skechers. You got Donald Trump in stakes. He's a real estate mogul. Come on, that makes no sense. Katy Perry and chips? That, no, it doesn't. And so I thought these were kind of funny, and I thought, why then do companies spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on celebrities for endorsements? And it follows this principle. It's likability. You are familiar with seeing these athletes, these rappers, these celebrities. You see them all over the place, and so these companies think, well, gosh, they are likable. They're recognizable. Therefore, we're going to pay the million dollars to sponsor our, our product. It doesn't make any sense, but it works because they've done it for generations. Here's another funny one with likability. Android offered Daniel Craig $50 million to carry an Android phone in, the two, or in uh, 007 Spectre. He and his producer turned it down because it, of consistency with Bond's character. They did not believe Bond would carry a phone that you could buy at your local mall. So... Android want to pay $50 million. Now, keep in mind, the production cost to make it was $100 million. So if you had a company willing to pay half of your production cost, as a producer, that's pretty impressive. But because of consistency, the previous principle, they turned it down. So from a business standpoint, a hard, hard thing to turn down. But from consistency standpoint, yeah, you're not going to have James Bond carrying a phone that every person, every 16-year-old kid has in his back pocket. Another thing with likability, engage people through questions. Find someone with the same unique interest, hobbies, or sports teams, or dislikes as you, and you will instantly be bonded to them. Ask questions, don't assume. The more unique the question, the better the answer. So think about the Cubs winning the World Series. If you're a Cubby fan, you are instantly connected to all the other Cub fans because you like the same team. You've waited 100 plus years to be in the World Series and to win it. That bonding brings you closer. So whenever you're meeting somebody, and I want you to really focus on this one. This one is crucial. Whenever you're meeting someone for the first time, please ask them very unique questions so that you can find out what is interesting about them and then see if you have that same thing in your life. So one of the questions I ask all the time, 
Other than work, what are you most passionate about? I am trying to link their passion to my passion. The other day I was coaching a client, sharing the same experience with her. I said, well, tell me something unique about yourself. And she said, oh, I'm from Jamaica. I said, oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to go to Jamaica next year. Instantly we bonded. I said, okay, where should I go? What places should I eat at? What beaches should I stay away from? And we bonded over her history and my future of where I was going to be going for work. So I'm going to give you some questions that you can ask people uh, from past, present, and future. So past, what is your favorite memory? What is your greatest accomplishment? If you could relive any one part of your life, what would it be and why? When you were growing up, did you always want to be doing what you're doing now? What is the greatest risk you've ever taken and was it worth it? So from our mastermind, I'm going to ask you guys that question right now. I want you to answer that and text it in to 951-973-3408. And then if I find one that is similar to my greatest risk I have ever taken, I'm going to have a conversation with that person backwards and forwards. I'm not going to mention their name. Once again, I always like to keep this kind of private so you can be as transparent and honest as you want. But go ahead and text me in at 951-973-3408. That's 951-973-3408. Three four zero eight. What is the greatest risk you've ever taken, and was it worth it? Go ahead, write that in. Text it in to me, guys. This is a team sport. We all got to play along together. What is the greatest risk you've ever taken, and was it worth it? So I have a couple coming in right now. Quitting a full-time job, and yes, it was worth it. Buying my Extreme Plus combo, risk of myself. Absolutely the best decision I've ever made. Moving to New York by myself at age 18. So worth it. Quit six-figure job impulsively and started this. Running a market. Changing my career from being a... Uh, uh, for changing my career while being responsible for my family. Going to my first addiction recovery meeting, waiting five and a half weeks to talk to my wife, future wife. So the one here on the wife, I would have, I would strike up a conversation with that individual. I met my wife on a Wednesday, we went out Thursday, or I'm sorry, I met my wife on a Wednesday, we went out Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I proposed to her. So instantly, we have a bond with this person. I waited six months to get my wife's attention. I couldn't get her attention in class. I volunteered to be the teacher one day. When I got up to speak, you know, okay, now my potential future girlfriend will know who I am, she got up and left the room. And I was stranded there now for an hour teaching class I did not want to teach and I was not prepared for. I just wanted to get her attention. But she was there to only hear the teacher. She saw me as a substitute, got up and left. And that crushed me. So I kept waiting around trying to find her, trying to get her attention. When I finally got her attention, I figured I'd already waited long enough. I was going to propose to her. And now we've been married for, you know, 21 years. So anything that is unique about you that you can tie to somebody else that is unique about them, you will have an instant bond. Someone, some other great comments, start a grocery business. Uh, changing my career while being responsible for family. Yep, perfect. All right, let's go on to the next questions. These are present tense questions. What are you most passionate about right now? So I wanted to ask you that question as well. Now, don't, don't respond Renatus and don't respond real estate. Go outside of your work and tell me what are you most passionate about right now? And then let's talk about those and I'm going to see if I can link myself to anyone else who has a similar passion to myself. So what are you most passionate about right now? Write a you know one or two word, maybe a one sentence only. But what are you most passionate about outside of Renatus and outside of work? Go ahead, text that in, 951-973-3408. Making a positive, positive difference in other people's lives. That would be very easy for me to comment on. I love coaching and teaching, helping other people, writing songs that change lives. That's a really unique one. That's cool. Teaching and uplifting others, reading more, so I could easily tap into the reading more. So you're passionate about reading. What's your favorite book you've read this year? 
and then I can easily go into the books that I've read. Live and interactive theater. So that'd be a fun one for me to tap into. You know, I've done some movies, but I've never done live theater. What does it feel like to be on stage? Asking someone a very specific, very unique question allows you to go deeper with them. So you don't have to have the exact same experience as them, but something similar. So even if you haven't made a movie, but you like movies, you know what? I really love movies. I love theater, but man, I'd be so scared to get on stage. Tell me what it's like for you to be on stage. Sharing my culture and talents with uh, and Tahitian, dan Tahitian dancing and doing private events. That'd be great. I would say, you know what? I put on private events all the time. What does it cost to have you come out and do it? I would love to have you cater and dance for our group. So do you see how when you go deeper than what their work is, you get to know them on a really core, very interesting level? Some other great questions. What are you working on right now that you are most excited about? What do you need in your personal life or business right now? When was the last time you felt on top of the world? What were you doing? If you could do anything right now and money was not an obstacle, what would you do? Once again, I'm going to send you guys this PowerPoint. I want you to be able to use it. Teach your prospects, teach your people these questions on how to engage with others. And I'm going to show you an experience I had last night where this absolutely came into play. So future questions. Where do you want to be in five years? What is in the horizon for you for the next six months? What do you want your legacy to be? So the question that I ask, what is the number one thing you need in your business right now? So on a Saturday, Statue of Responsibility, we had a gala here in Utah. For those of you who went, it was fantastic. And one of their guest speakers was Emmanuel Kelly. Emmanuel Kelly was on The X Factor. I highly, highly recommend. If you have children or if you want to be inspired today, watch his video. Type in on YouTube, X Factor, Emmanuel Kelly, and you're going to see one of the most gut-wrenching, heartfelt stories you have ever seen. This young man was literally left in a shoebox to die. He was taken to an orphanage. He has a disease. He doesn't have any fingers or hands or you know legs, per se. He, I mean, just unbelievable challenges and tragedies. I think he's had 56 surgeries. He was adopted. And he is on the world stage in Australia singing for X Factor Australia. So he was there. He was singing for us. He came down and sat at my table. And I turned to him. I said, what is the number one thing you need in your business right now or in your personal life? And he was kind of taken back. He's like, um, I, I don't know. No one's ever asked me that question. Give me a second. So he sat there and he's contemplating. He's like, I, I honestly, I've never been asked that question my entire life. The reason why no one ever asked him that question is because people just don't care. And that's, I hate to say it that way, but so often we're so focused on ourselves that we don't care about other people. And I have this belief, if I can't create value for another person, I do not ask them a question. The whole reason why this organization knows of the statute of responsibility is I was at a meeting at the university of, or UVU University. I was sitting there watching Gary Sculpt, didn't know who he was. I had just came from California to Utah. I'd only been in Utah two and a half weeks, had a business meeting at the UVU. I'm sitting there while I see this great man sculpting this 15 foot statue. And I'm asking myself, what question could I ask him that would create value for him? Because if I can't ask him a question of value, I'm just not going to talk to him. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, I read all of his brochures, I look at all of his art, and I love art. And I walked up to him, I said, you know, tell me what this means. I, I, I believe it means something more than what it looks like. The two hands, that's inspirational, I get it. Does, it must have a deeper meaning. And he came off his ladder and he told me the story of Viktor Frankl and the Statue of Liberty and the Statue of Responsibility. And we bonded instantly. And to create value for him, I said, you know what? Your story is so amazing. Can I come and film your story? So I hired a film crew. I went to his studio three days later, filmed his story. That video is on uh, YouTube and it's also on the website, statueofresponsibility.com or .org. Just type in Gary Lee Price story. And it is gut-wrenching story about how his, you know, he saw his mother murdered in front of him, and then his stepfather took his own life, and it was just this gut-wrenching story, and then all about responsibility and life choices. So that question that I asked four years ago changed my life. I've got the pleasure to literally be with Gary and Lisa on a weekly basis for four years. I sit on the advisory board. I've gone to the galas. I've helped raise over a million dollars. I've been able to introduce it to Renatus. You guys have raised hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. All of that happened 
by one very simple question. So with Emmanuel, I'm sitting next to him and I ask him a very similar question. What do you need in your life? He said, I don't know. I said, well, you know what? I'd love to take you to dinner and find out how I can help you and serve you. He said, great. So this picture right here is of last night we were at dinner. The top picture you see on your screen, you'll see a young family. The woman in the hat in the far right is Cass Martin. I asked Cass Martin that same question about two years ago. She is the, the face of Zumba. So if you are into Zumba or you know of Zumba, she is on the Xbox Zumba. She is on the Wii Zumba. She travels the world 42 weeks out of the year. She was in Belgium last weekend. She's in Switzerland next weekend. She's a client of mine. She's a one-on-one -on -one client. But that all came about because I asked her, what do you need in your business right now? So while I was sitting with Emmanuel and Cass, and we had Gary and Lisa were there as well. They'd already left um, when we took the picture. I wanted to figure out what I could do to serve him. So he told me, you know, he just signed with Bruno Mars. He was doing all these things, but he, he wanted to create some more urgency. He wanted to do a video with Lindsay Sterling. If you're not familiar with Lindsay, she does the violin and does a really cool dancing you'll see on YouTube. She does about $6 million a year just on YouTube. She lives here in Utah. A friend of mine is a friend of hers, so I called up Christian. I said, hey, can you get us in contact with Lindsay? Emmanuel wants to do a song. And then I introduced her to Brittany Snyder, Bob's daughter, who also does amazing, um, just does amazing uh, songwriting and so forth. And so we put those two in contact, and they're going to get together this week. So when you meet with somebody, you don't have to answer all the questions. You just simply have to create value for everybody else. And it'll always come together, and it's right there for you. Let's go on to likability. You've seen me use uh, credit cards all the time on my order forms. It's all because of this study. Leveraging likability. Use credit card insignias on your websites and handouts. Consumer researcher Richard uh, Feinberg did a study on students who were purchasing for mail order catalogs. They would spend 29% more if the logos were in the room. In contributions to the United Way, 87% would donate versus 33% when the logo was present. That's insane. That is an 85% increase of percentage on United Way's website when the insignias were there. So you should have those in your offices. You should have those on your order forms. And you can buy them at Office Depot. You can print them offline. It's easy, but use the logos. All right, the next one is authority. People follow authority. I've used this one before. I want to share it with you again. Jaywalking, they did a study in Texas. They took a 31-year-old man, dressed him in street clothes, had him walk across the street. Not many people followed. They did this study multiple times. They dressed him in a nicely pressed suit and counted the amount of people who followed by him jaywalking, and it was a three-and-a-half time amount increase. You're talking about 350% increase in jaywalkers simply because he's wearing a suit. I've experienced that personally in San Diego when I was speaking at regionals down there for uh, Kindle and it was fan and Darren Kindle and Darren and it was fantastic. Where we're at the airport, no one's crossing. A guy in a suit just goes right out of the middle of the street, and literally about 30, 40 people just followed right after him. And I was laughing so hard. And Bob was laughing we're like, "This is what we coached on. This is ridiculous. We all fell for it." So yes, it works. Dress to be addressed. How you want to look is how people will treat you. This one we have shared again as well. I still want to bring it back up because I want you to have all of this on the same, um, the same PowerPoint that you can share it with your people. Harvard did a study on the word because to see if it had any value. And they had a line of people using the Xerox machine. And so they had different versions of requests. So the first version was, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine? Second version was a request with a real reason. Excuse me, I have five pages. May I use a Xerox copy machine because I'm in a rush? Version three, the request had a fake reason. Excuse me, I have five pages. May I use a Xerox machine because I have to make copies? Well, everybody in line has to make copies. Duh, of course we're in line because we're making copies. But now look at the results. Version one, 60% of the people would let them cut. Version two, 94%. Version 3, 93%. A 1% difference solely because the word because. 
Whether you're in a rush or whether you have many copies, that didn't matter. It was the difference was the word because. So when you're selling and you're going for authority, I want you to join this company, this opportunity, because I know it'll make a difference for you. And I started thinking about why does because have such a strong anchor in our psyche? Go back to childhood. You're two, you're three, you're four years old, you're asking how the world works, and your parents kept saying because, because. In psych uh, psychologically, they are your superior, they are, they are the authority, so we cave to the word because. I have done it many times in my closing pitches, and it works. Social proof. Mirroring is where you copy images of other people, actions of other people, or you watch an image of other people. So kids with phobias who had this you know, strong desire and were afraid of dogs, they did a study where they took nursery age school children who were deathly afraid of dogs and had them watch other kids playing with dogs for 20 minutes on videos. After only four days, 67% of them were willing to climb into the playpen and play with dogs. That is amazing. They watched kids playing with dogs. Therefore, they were able to get in the playpen and play with them because they were just, they had visualized, they had seen it. I had a very interesting experience last night with my daughter who's seven years old. Now, I like to volunteer. We go down to the food bank. We make sandwiches. We do those kinds of things. But for some reason, reason she has been too young to take. When we were with Emmanuel Kelly, she was deathly afraid of him. He has, you know, his arms are disfigured. He's very short. He stumbles as he walks. And I could see her just cringing. And I took her aside and I said, sweetie, are you okay? She said, yes. I said, are you afraid of Emmanuel? She said, I am. I said, why? And she said, I, I and she couldn't, she couldn't with her cute, sweet little personality. She couldn't describe it. I said, does his body scare you? And she said, yes. And I said, do you realize that God made him that way? And instantly she had a different association. She's like, really? And I said, yes. Everyone is made differently. Different skin colors, different hair colors, different heights, and different diseases and challenges. And it took her a little while to get it because she just hadn't been exposed to it for some reason or hadn't seen it. And I thought to myself how important it is for our children to be exposed to it. So when she was younger and dolls, I bought dolls of every race of skin color because I think it's important for her not to live in a white vanilla world. And so she's not afraid of skin color. She's not afraid of that. But it was the disfigurement of his hand that really scared her because she's not been exposed to that yet. So social proof is a huge thing even for small children to overcome fears, but also for adults to overcome fears. When Prince was starting out, he was horrific. They would not put him on stage. He was a musical prodigy. He was a genius with the guitar and lyrics, but he was so scared on stage that they just wouldn't put him on. Now, you know Prince. You've seen his performances. I mean, these pictures right here, his different uh, styles, you think there's no way that guy was ever shy. He was hor just horrified to go on stage. So for one year, his studio, uh, uh, his um, record company said, you know what, we want you to follow this band. We want you to stand behind stage, and we just want you to watch. So for one year, he would mirror them. He just had to watch over and over and over again. And then that taught him how to have charisma. So if you are ever fearful of public speaking, if you're ever fearful of uh, talking to people in your three foot, it's mirroring. Go with somebody else and watch how they do it. Another thing, social proof. The Ice Bucket Challenge raised $100 million in six months. They would usually raise about $2.8 million, but that is a 3,500% increase simply because of social proof. When your brother or your family member or your sister is calling you out on Facebook to do a, the Ice Bucket Challenge, you cave and you do it because of social proof. One of my favorite things is crowdfunding. I love Kickstarter.com. If you're not familiar with Kickstarter, go on there. Support local and, and worldwide entrepreneurs with their concepts and ideas. Crowdfunding, according to Forbes, raised $6 billion in 2013. Kickstarter did $500 million in 2014 alone. This top right-hand corner, this was a simple game called Exploding Kittens, a card game for people who are into kittens and explosions. I mean, that sounds ridiculous. That is not something you'd buy at Target. But they raised $8.7 million in 30 days, and 219,000 people supported them. That is all about social proof. The coolest cooler, where it has a blender on top of the cooler, 
raised $13 million from 62,000 backers. If they had put that product at Cabela's or at Big Five, they never would have sold $13 million in 30 days. But because social proof, boom, they're able to do it. Now let's look at your business. If you want to build your business, you have to attend your meetings. Now I know you guys are all the experts, but I want to create this slide so you can teach your people the importance. One of the main gauges people use to decide to believe is based off what other people are doing or believing. So if you have 60 people in a room and 20 of them are guests and 40 are your current IMAs, those other 20 people will look to the 40 and say, oh my gosh, this place is rocking and rolling. I got to be here. But if you have three people in the room and two of them are IMAs and one person is thinking, ah, this is not the kind of place I want to be. Number two, people are more likely to rely on social proof when there's uncertainty. They don't know what decision to make. So they will look to social norms. The reason why the jaywalking thing works with authority is after a couple people have walked out there, the social norm is, oh, I can jaywalk as well. Even though I know it's illegal, but everybody else is doing it, so I can do it as well. Number three, social proof is most influential when there is similarity. That's a herd mentality. If you see others like you acting a certain way, you are more likely to act the same way. The ice bucket challenge again. Scarcity. The tulip craze was the first recorded economic bubble based on speculation and scarcity. Back in the 1600s, um, tulips had come in from South America. And in Belgium, in Switzerland, they didn't have tulips at that time. So literally people, kings, were trading castles and land for tulips. And they were going for insane amounts of money. Well, you know what a tulip is, you plant it, the next year it grows again, and there's multiple of them. So all of a sudden, after a couple years, there are thousands of tulips for sale, and now nobody wants it. But when there was scarcity, oh my gosh, people literally traded castles for tulips. This is a personal experience I have with scarcity. So I sold a home to the drummer of the Smashing Pumpkins. Named, his name is Jimmy Chamberlain. When I was in California, we had a home in a gated community, beautiful home. We had bought it, and we had not moved in. We bought it on speculation. took six months to build. Homes were appreciating at 30% per year out in, in that area. And we thought, oh, you know what? Let's buy it. My brother bought a home next to it. And I thought, hey, worst case, I move in to my, next to my brother or I sell it. So the realtor called up and said, hey, we want this house full price offer. And by the way, I did not have any other offers. She put the offer within about 15 minutes of me listing it on the MLS. I said, oh, you know what? Uh, there's been a lot of traction on this home. There's been a lot of people interested in it. And she said, what would it cost for my client to have this home? And I said, who's your client? And she said, you know, it's Jimmy Chamberlain, the, the drummer of the Smashing Pumpkins. I said, you know what? That was her first mistake telling me who it is because I knew he had money. So you know what? 15 grand more and the home is yours. So I sold the home full price plus a $15,000 premium just because of scarcity. They didn't know. She was so fearful that there were other people who wanted the home and the homes were selling so quickly, they paid $15,000 premium. I had another home years later on a place called Wandering Place and I put the home up basically for auction and every single thing inside of it for auction. I sold the home for $50,000 more than I wanted to. I sold every single thing I had in my home. I sold my first Viper. I sold my golf cart. I sold all of our bedroom furniture. We sold everything in the home just to see if we could. We probably made, gosh, uh, with the premium of the 50 grand, the Viper, and everything else, I think we made an extra $130,000 on top of it solely by creating this have to have, you know, frenzy. Think about eBay. Um, at the gala we were at on uh, Saturday, people were outbidding other people because there's that scarcity mentality. If you're going to sell a car, have everyone come at the exact same time. Don't set an appointment at 2 o'clock, 2.30 and 3. Have three people show up at 2 o'clock and say, oh, well, this person was first. If they don't want to buy it, then you can take a look at it. At that point now, people are have a mental scarcity herd mentality. There's social proof that other people want the car. It's a fantastic way. Same thing with if you're in rent a property, have everyone show up at the same time. Reciprocity. This is my absolute number one, just the absolute, my all-time favorite principle to create relationships and money. 
I have you know, assisted in raising over a million dollars with statue responsibly solely by reciprocity. Giving statues or buying statues and giving them to one-on-one -on -one clients who then would donate the statue. Um, introductions to other people, all because of reciprocity. Uh, I apologize, that last sentence is missing the rest of it. I was given over $200,000 in B-roll because I've given a company some flowers and some chocolates. I've told you guys a story about getting my uh, B-roll for my movie, and I just wanted some free B-roll, and they wouldn't do it, and so I sent them chocolates and candies, and lo and behold, they gave me $200,000 worth of B-roll, and I think I spent a couple hundred bucks on chocolates and candies. Reciprocity is number one. One time I was, in, I was in charge of Friends of Scouting, trying to raise money for my local scout troop. I took um, $105 bills and I mailed them to 100 different people and I simply said, hey, here is a, re a stamped addressed envelope. Please match this, doll this $5 or add to it. We ended up raising $3,700 and we only needed to raise basically $1,200, 300% increase because I had given them $5. If you get $5 cash in the mail, you're going to feel way too guilty holding on to that money. You're going to want to give it back. And so that's what they did, and they gave back some people tenfold, and it worked. One of my other favorite techniques with reciprocity is the rejection, then the reoffer. So this was a case study done. They went to college students and said, you know what? We want you to uh, chaperone a bunch of juvenile delinquents at the zoo. And 83% said, no way. Then they said, okay, let's go with a crazier offer, like a bigger offer, and then come down to a smaller offer. So the big offer was, we want you to commit to spending two hours a week mentoring a juvenile, and that is for an entire year. 100% of the college students said, no way. Then they re-offered and said, um, would you be willing to take some kids to the zoo? 350% increase in acceptance because the re-offer was smaller than the big offer. So how can you use that in your business? What questions, what major commitments can you give them that scare them to death and then come up with a shorter one, an easier one? Uh, think about kids for a second. If you go to your kids and say, okay, I need you guys to clean the garage on Saturday, it'll probably take you about five hours. Or you can do the dishes. Well, they're going to do the dishes instantly because they know it's not going to take them five hours. But if you say, hey, kids, will you do the dishes today? Oh, I don't want to do the dishes. Don't make me do the dishes. But if it's the... Five hours in the garage or the dishes for 10 minutes, they'll do it without complaint. This is a picture of the courtyard right now that we're, uh, we're redoing. Some of you guys were here for our uh, event we had and saw it was under construction. This is a technique I've used for years and years, and I want to break it down for you because it will save you tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. It's called the offer, reject offer, counter offer. So the way this works is, and the key is, you have to be paying someone already for the work at your home. So when you're having, and since we're all in real estate, I thought this would really apply to you guys. Let's say you're going to have your um, concrete work done. And let's say you need five pieces of a driveway replaced. I'd have them come out and bid me only three pieces, and this is exactly what I did. In fact, I'll just start off at the beginning. Um, we had a painter come out and do some painting in the house. And this guy's a true artist. I mean, amazing, amazing work. To paint just the cove, like we have just this little inlet cove, it was going to be $1,300 and to touch up some work in the, um, in the living room. And I said, no, nope, I'm going to reject that offer. And then I waited about a couple hours just to see if he would counter offer. And he came back. He said, you know what? Since I'm already here, I've got my supplies. I could probably do that for 100 bucks." I said, you know what? You make it $150, and I'll do it. And you always want to overpay for gratitude on small amounts. And I'll explain why in a second. But always overpay on small amounts. Fight the big amounts, overpay on the small amounts. Concrete, doing the same thing. I had three sections replaced for $1,800. So that's basically $600 per section. Now, they're already out there. They have their crew out there. They have their bobcat, their dump truck. Then they wanted to do another four additional sections. I said, okay. Do those other four for $1,800 and you got a deal. So that lowered the price down to $450 per section. Then I had one individual piece by itself that was all cracked and needed to be removed. And they offered me $500 and I said, no. They came back an hour later and said, well, how about $300? Because it literally took them like 10 minutes to do. So I ended up saving about $1,200 to $1,500 because I had them come out and then I started lowballing their bids since they were already there. 
So had I come out originally and say, hey, I want all these pieces, the bid would have been much higher. Sonny, the concrete guy, offered to hang my lights in the courtyard for $150. Said, nope, I'll pay you $200 because you saved me $200 on my concrete. Later that day, I was in my office working, and I saw him with the bobcat in the backyard scooping up a bunch of rocks. I ran out there thinking, you know, I don't want to be charged something if I haven't been given a bid. And I said, you know, no, 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 stop. What's the bid for this? He said, oh, no, it's free for you. Because I gave him $50 tip, he then cleaned out my backyard with these rocks, which would have cost me anywhere from $250 to $500 solely by hiring a bobcat and a dump truck and the dump cost removal. So, you guys, there are some fun things for reciprocity, the six principles of persuasion. When I have this recording done, I will send it to you. I'll probably have to take this PowerPoint and put it into a Dropbox and then send you the link, and you can download it because it's probably going to be too big to send via email. But I appreciate you. I hope you have a fantastic day. Go out and crush it. Use these six principles of persuasion, and I will talk to you next week.